Hi there and welcome back to Utility Sports and in today's video we will be focusing on our annual NBA award show based on the 2021-2022 season of course in this rendition. If you guys are new to Utility Sports make sure to check out some of our other videos, leave a like on today's video and of course hit that subscribe button as well if you are new it would be greatly appreciated. The channel has been growing like crazy uh, and we do really appreciate all the love and support that we've seen in the comment section so make sure to leave your comments as well turn on the notification bell and without further ado let's jump into it here and these are the awards we will be focusing on today the nba coach of the year of course who's been the best coach this season we'll talk about the candidates and also who i have winning this award uh the executive of the year we'll also talk about the executives who have really helped put their team in a position to win more games and just a quick note here for the video these are my picks. These are not necessarily my predictions. However, some of my picks, I think, line up with what my predictions will be. Rookie of the year, sixth man of the year, most improved player, which I think is a really interesting topic of discussion. Defensive player of the year. Again, another very interesting topic of discussion. There's a few different ways you could look at it. And then also the most valuable player. So who is the MVP of the 2021-2022 season? We will be going in this order. So saving the most important award in MVP for last. We also have my all NBA team selection up on the channel. I'll try and put a card in this video for that video, uh, but also just go check it out on the channel if it's not in there when you actually see this video. So let's go forward here. And I am recording this by the way on April 3rd. So, you know, maybe last week of the season shifts everything around, but here's the candidates that I think are gonna get some serious consideration for NBA coach of the year. JB Bickerstaff from the Cleveland Cavaliers, Mostly because a lot of these awards, uh, when people are voting, it's like, oh, we didn't expect this to happen, and it happened. Uh, so expectations do play a large role into the narrative going into awards. Monty Williams, uh, phenomenal season here with the Suns, probably going to have a 65-win season. Absolutely incredible, the year that they've had. Ime Udoka for the Boston Celtics. I mean, post-All-Star break, they've been the best team in the league, arguably. They've been absolutely phenomenal. Uh, and probably not even arguably. I'd just say flat out probably the best team in the league. Eric Spolster from the Miami Heat. Uh, they've overcome so many different injuries. So I think Spo does deserve a lot of credit here for getting that team to win a bunch of games. You look at the development track there with guys like Gabe Vincent playing big roles. You know, they just get the most out of their guys. Omer Yurt7, who is a summer league pickup. It's, it's insane what the Miami Heat can do. Uh, they do such a great job. And they also have Taylor Jenkins here for the Grizzlies, another surprise team. He'll get some looks simply because uh, a lot of people weren't expecting them to be the two seed in the Western Conference. Anyone who's been watching the Grizzlies though, last two three seasons they know taylor jenkins is, is a very good coach uh, and i think they they nailed that higher when they brought him in alongside john morant uh the grizzlies have really been uh in an upward trajectory the last three years so taylor jenkins i love that he's going to be getting some recognition now but i think realistically if we're going to be honest about it there's only one candidate that really makes a lot of sense and that is monty williams from the phoenix suns far and away the best record in the league this year that's really what it comes down to you look at an example of another coach that had a similar pathway here was Mike D'Antoni when they won 60 plus games with the Rockets. I believe it was the 2018, 2019 season. Uh, so the fact here that, you know, the Suns have this type of record uh, and have had this type of success probably points to Monty Williams being the head coach of the year. They've just won too many games. I think last year didn't win the award. I think he was deserving last year as well. In my opinion, Voters will give it to him. This is not only my pick, but also a prediction here. I think Monty Williams will ultimately win the NBA Coach of the Year Award, and I do think it is very well-deserved. Make sure to comment your pick down in the comment section. Moving on to Executive of the Year, one that I don't think a lot of people really talk about, uh, but I think it's an interesting one to discuss, and I have three good candidates here. Zach Kleiman from the Memphis Grizzlies, uh, who's really seen a lot of his draft selections specifically paying off. And also the, the surprising move of moving on from Valanchunas to Steven Adams, getting a better screen setter in there. The Grizzlies have greatly improved. He's also, again, the head coach hire of Taylor Jenkins, I think was a massive hit for this franchise. So I do think Zach Kleiman, who is the GM there for the Memphis Grizzlies, deserves a lot of credit. Kobe Altman from the Cleveland Cavaliers, the president of basketball operations there. Another person who deserves a lot of credit this season for the Cavaliers. They nailed their draft pick with Evan Mobley in round one. Uh, and then the big one here that I, I think a lot of people gave backlash to, and I said during free agency last offseason, don't give this backlash. This is a phenomenal signing. And it was when he gave Jared Allen five years, $100 million. People were kind of taken aback by that saying, whoa, 
Is he worth that? Clearly, yes. The Cavaliers have been really good this season. I know the last you know month and a half of the year hasn't been kind on them, but they've withheld a lot of injuries. And the fact that they're still where they're at shows how good of a job Kobe Altman's done. If Ricky Rubio didn't get injured, they probably still could have been a top four or five seed in the East as well. Uh, so I think Kobe Altman deserves a ton of credit here. And then Arturis Karnisovic uh, as well from the Chicago Bulls. He's going to be one of the four uh, front runners here simply because of how many moves he's made in the last 18 months. Uh, you look at the move specifically for Nikola Vucevic, uh, signing Lonzo Ball, who was great before he got injured. Bringing out Caruso was huge. And of course, the DeMar DeRozan signing was an absolute hit. So the Bulls, uh, Arturis Knesovic, I think deserves a lot of credit as well. Uh, and here, my actual executive of the year is Arturis for the Bulls. I just think that he is well-deserving of this award. Again, the amount of moves that he had to make uh, and where he inherited Chicago after coming over from Denver does deserve a ton of credit. I think he was a huge part of Denver's success uh, as an assistant over there. And now actually getting to call the shots and run the operation in Chicago. He's done a really good job so far. Uh, and I think, you know, he had a lot of pressure on him too. You look at Zach Levine, who's headed toward free agency this off season. He had to prove to Levine that they could build a winner there in Chicago. Uh, and had it not been for injuries, this team could have been a top three seed in the East uh, and very likely still going to be a playoff team. We'll see how the play in all shakes out. But Karnishevis here is highly deserving of this award. He's been really, really solid in the decisions he's made up to this point. He's also found some really nice depth pieces in Iowa Dasum new. Javante Green's been pretty solid for them. So uh, all in all here, I think Chicago uh, and Karnishevis very deserving of an award for executive of the year. Moving on to rookie of the year. I've got three candidates written down. Now, this has been a great uh, rookie class. And again, I think next year's rookie class can be really strong as well. So make sure to go check out one of our NBA mock drafts on the channel. Uh, but like three candidates here at the top, Evan Mobley, Scotty Barnes, Cade Cunningham. And it's going to really pain me here to leave two of these guys off the winners list because I think they're all really great. Scotty Barnes has been huge for the Raptors. Evan Mobley has been phenomenal for the Cavs. And then Cade Cunningham, the last, you know, three months probably has been the best rookie. Just had a slower first month than Mobley and Barnes and hasn't had quite the degree of winning. So I would be shocked if Kate Cunningham does win it, even though I think his future is still maybe the brightest out of all these guys. Uh, he's where the NBA is at. So if I were to actually pick a guy I'd want, Pistons fans, I'd probably take Kate Cunningham still. I said it last year before pick one. I said, Pistons just need to take Kate. Uh, I thought Kate was the best player in the class. And I still stand by that, even though, you know, Mobley and Barnes, they've won a little bit more. They went to a little bit better situations. You know, Detroit with Jeremy Grant out, there just wasn't a lot to work with there for Cade Cunningham in year one. They've got a pick to try and supplement that. But really then my selection comes down between Mobley and Barnes. And I think this is going to be a highly anticipated one. I'm choosing Evan Mobley here from Cleveland. Very tough though. I am very high on Scotty Barnes. You can go check out my video on draft night last year when the Raptors took Barnes over Jalen Suggs and I told Raptors fans that they should be ecstatic and happy about it despite the popular opinion at the time being that Suggs was better than uh, that Suggs was better than Barnes. I'm, I have to go Mobley here though. I think his impact's been a little bit higher um, and you know I think the Raptors have a few better pieces around. Now I know Garland's really stepped up his play and Jared Allen has as well. Uh, they're in Cleveland, but you look at Toronto and they've got Van Vliet. They've got a, a really good head coach in Nick Nurse. Uh, they've got Siakam, Gary Trent Jr., OG Ananobi, who, you know, he's dealt with some injuries this year. Uh, but the Raptors, I think overall their roster is just very good. Uh, and I think Evan Mobley has been a little more pivotal for the success. But again, this is a very tough selection. Raptors fans, don't be mad at me. You guys know how much I love Scotty Barnes. Uh, and I would maybe even take Barnes long term. Uh, but I think Mobley, uh, this rookie season, maybe just out edges him a little bit. Moving on now to the next award, six man of the year. I've got one candidate, uh, Tyler Hero. There is no need to really discuss this further. My winner is Tyler Hero. He's in the middle of a phenomenal six man season. Uh, he's setting pretty much every single record for six man of the year. He's going to have a scoring season better than Jamal Crawford ever did, better than Lou Williams ever did, better than Jason Terry ever did off the bench. It just doesn't happen like this. So you get a 20 point per game score off the bench. Uh, Tyler Hero has been phenomenal. Now I know defensively he has some of his own limitations, but they're in Miami. He's arguably their best shot creator. Him and Jimmy Butler and Butler's been kind of struggling this season a little bit. So Tyler Hero might be their best go-to score in the playoffs, uh, which is not very, you know, when it's something we're not accustomed to seeing 
in the NBA playoffs as a team having their best score come off the bench. Uh, but there's a real argument here that Tyler Hero is just flat out the best score for the Miami Heat. So I, I think this is a no-brainer here. Tyler Hero, six man of the year. Make sure you guys are commenting your picks as we go along. We're into the most improved player uh, candidates here. And this is one that's, one that's very, very tough for me. Desmond Bain from the Memphis Grizzlies. Deserves a lot of credit. Darius Garland heading into year three this year. Really proved a lot with the Cavaliers. First time All-Star. John Morant took the step from star to superstar, uh, which is really tough. But at the same time, I saw this coming. Uh, so I'm not as surprised as I think everyone else in the media is. Uh, you know, for anyone who's been around the channel knows that I picked John Morant over Zion Williamson uh, in the same class. And I thought Morant was going to be the better player. Uh, up to this point, he's been healthier and I think realistically been better as well. Tyrese Maxey from the 76ers. Uh, we'll talk about him here for a little bit. You know, there's a there's a conversation around that, oh, a second year player shouldn't win most improved player because they're just going to see a bigger role because they're going into their second year. They're no longer a rookie. Yes, that's true. They do usually receive a, a bigger role, but you have to perform in that bigger role. And that's way more difficult than it seems. You know, a guy like Tyler Hero going into year two didn't actually take as much of a step forward because teams had, you know, more film on him. They could scout him a little bit. Uh, and just because there's an assumed rise in role doesn't mean it's easy to accomplish. And and Maxi and Bain here, two guys in year two, have accomplished that. Uh, Bain had been phenomenal. Tyrese Maxi went from a non-shooter to pretty dangerous off the bounce, really good in catch and shoot. And he's he just knifes through defenses. I mean, his ability to get to the rim, you know, I knew he had it coming in, but it's better than I thought. Uh, and I think that Tyrese Maxey uh, really deserves some looks here for most improved player. And then I also have DeJounte Murray here from the San Antonio Spurs. So again, a really good crop of most improved players. Uh, I think there's a few guys on here that I, I left off as well that I could have put on here, uh, but it's hard. I don't want to have more than five to seven candidates really because it gets a little messy then at that point. Uh, but my most improved pick here is DeJounte Murray from San Antonio. I uh, went from about 15 points a game last year to 22 this year. I uh, also went from about five assists to nine assists this year. I'm pretty sure he leads the league in triple doubles outside of Jokic. Uh, so again, pretty insane what DeJounte Murray has done this season for San Antonio. Uh, of course, those Fiesta jerseys uh, always help his play look a little nice on the floor too. Uh, but he has just immensely improved in pretty much every aspect. His ability to read defenses. Uh, of course, the absence of DeMar DeRozan has really led to an, uh, a, an, a, an upgrade for role for him, excuse me. Uh, but here with DeJounte Murray, again, the, the, just because there's more, you know, if for him to do, just because there's more opportunity for him, doesn't mean it just comes easy. His efficiency's actually gotten better. Uh, and he's also just playing at a, a high level and keeping San Antonio in the play-in and playoff race. So uh, DeJounte Murray, I think, highly deserving of this most improved player. It's tough to not give it to Garland, who's a first-time All-Star. Tough not to give it to Ja, who's taken a massive step. Tough not to give it to Bain. I think this is the most difficult one to pick, probably, outside of MVP. Moving on to Defensive Player of the Year, and this is where I had to include a few more candidates because I think there's a lot of deserving players, and we can talk about them all individually. Rudy Gobert is clearly the best defensive player uh, in the league, I think, when it comes to actual you know, skill set uh, and what he really does for a defense. Uh, and there's a reason he's a three-time Defensive Player of the Year. Robert Williams has been the best defensive player on the best defensive team. If you consider rim protection the most important element, I also have Marcus Smart on here for the Celtics because he's their best perimeter defender. He's usually on the best ball handler, best creator for a team. So Robert Williams, Marcus Smart, you know, it's not going to be surprising here that there's two candidates for the best defense in the league. Uh, the Ro Robert Williams makes a lot of sense because he's their backline defender. He plays free safety, keeps the the rim clear, also does some of the rebounding there in Boston. And the biggest change for them uh, around the All-Star break was moving him to off-ball center, where he did not guard the pick and roll big a lot. Uh, let Al Horford do that. And then Robert Williams was behind cleaning everything up, which was huge. Even though he's very switchable, uh, you know, his ability to also do stuff on the backside is huge. Marcus Smart, we talked about him. Patrick Beverly will, will not win it, but his culture change in Minnesota, you could argue that his defensive capabilities has empowered Minnesota to be an actual good defensive team for the first time in like 15 years. Uh, so that's huge for Minnesota because, you know, whatever Beverly does on the stat sheet and whatever his opponent field goal percentage is, his antics, the way he gets into people's heads, the way he kind of fuels an arena – I think is way bigger in Minnesota than anyone really gives it credit. So I think Patrick Beverly does deserve some consideration, probably even for all NBA first team defense. 
Jaron Jackson Jr. from the Grizzlies, he's taking a massive step forward. He's fouling less, protecting the rim at a higher rate, kind of seeing everything that we thought he could be when he was the fourth overall selection a few years back. Uh, defensively, he was special coming into the draft. First couple of years, I think he struggled with the speed of the game uh, and just fouling a little too frequently, which was a ma major red flag for him coming out of college. He's really toned everything down. Uh, and I think it's very, very uh, well-deserved to see him on this list. Mikhail Bridges from the Suns, uh, a player who probably doesn't get enough praise around the league. He's going to guard the best, def uh, best offensive player night in, night out. And he's one of the most sticky, tough guys to beat off the dribble defenders in the league. He's very lengthy. He can disrupt passing lanes. Uh, but he's also just very technically sound. So I think uh, Mikhail Bridges here, probably one of the most underrated defenders in the league. And another underrated defender here, Dorian Finney-Smith from the Dallas Mavericks. He is tasked with guarding the best player every single night for Dallas. And Dallas has been a top five defense this year, which I don't think anyone saw coming. Jason Kidd deserves a ton of credit for that. I don't think he'll win, be in the coach of the year consideration, but I think he'll be right on the outside of that uh, because of what he's done defensively. And Dorian Finney-Smith's been huge. You know, the moving away from Kristaps Porzingis, I had some questions about that rim protection at that level because, you know, Dwight Powell, not really a great rim protector. Maxi Kleba, okay defensively as a rim protector. Uh, but really what they've been playing with is really switchable. Uh, they've got, you know, a, a good idea of doubling down in the post pretty much on any post-up player in the league. Uh, and Dorian Finney-Smith is just guarding the best player every single night. So I think he does deserve some consideration as well. But with that said, I think my defensive player of the year has to be Rudy Gobert. Uh, again, anyone who watches the games knows what his impact is. Uh, he just makes life miserable for opposing centers. The shot quality around the rim is way worse. And we play in a league, you know, here with the NBA where it's either threes or at the rim for the most part. And Rudy Gobert takes away one element of the game. Uh, the Jazz defensively do not have any other good defenders other than maybe Royce O'Neal, who's an okay defender. He's an effort defender, not really the best defender in terms of technique and skill set, but he's very, very high effort on that end of the floor. Without Gobert, though, the Jazz would be the worst defensive team ever, arguably. Uh, just no one there plays defense outside of O'Neal and Gobert, uh, and Gobert really just is massive. And the one thing about him, too, uh, his more switchable than everyone thinks. He's actually pretty good in advanced analytics when he switched on to guards out on the perimeter. He holds his own actually way better than anyone would presume. Uh, so for me with Rudy Gobert, you look at the on-off defensive rating splits, really, really massive difference there. So for me, I think Rudy Gobert is deserving of this defensive player of the year. Now we get into the fun one, most valuable player. And there's four candidates here, and I actually have them labeled A, B, C, and D because I think everyone's you know narrowed it down to a two or three person race. Earlier in the year, the mainstream media would have had you believe it's a two person race between Jokic and Embiid. And now the media is telling you, oh, it's a three person race. Realistically, it should be four when you consider stats, winning, usage, everything involved. When we talk about value, this fourth player needs to be on this list. So candidate A has played 63 games, averaging just north of 30 points a game, almost 12 rebounds, almost six assists, a steal and a block and a half a game, 55% from the field, 30% from three, 48 and 29 record overall. And he's 42 and 21 when he plays, which is a 67% win percentage. And you can see the team is seven and eight with, or six and eight, excuse me, without him. So again, this player is really good, highly impacts his team winning, uh, has been available in a bunch of games and has really good numbers to back it up. Candidate B, 64 games. So nearly the same number as candidate A. 30 points a game, 11 and a half rebounds, 4.3 assists per game. So in the counting numbers, uh, in the counting stats here, just a little bit lower than candidate A in pretty much everything. 1.1 steals per game and 1.4 blocks per game. So very similar defensive statistics. 49% from the field, so about 6% lower here than candidate A. But 36% from three, so 6% better as a three-point shooter. 47 and 30 team record, so one game worse than candidate A. And 42 and 22 when candidate B plays. So... Very similar to candidate A. You can say the candidate A, candidate B, both very similar together. Candidate C has 71 games, about 26 and a half points a game. So notably less scoring, but also averaging way more rebounds at 13 and a half a game. Eight assists a game as well. So again, notably more. 1.4 steals per game, almost a block a game, 58% from the field, which is huge, 34% from three, a 46 and 32 team record, and 44 and 27 when he plays so the team is two and five without him whereas for candidate b it was five and eight without him and for candidate a it was six and eight without him
So candidate C has a very strong claim as well. Uh, and I'm gonna tell you right now, candidate C has a very strong claim through analytics. Candidate D, 61 games, 28.3 points a game. So more than candidate C. 9.1 rebounds a game, which is the least on this list, but again, still very substantial number at nine rebounds a game. 8.6 assists a game, the most out of any player on this list. 1.1 steals per game, which is right on track with B and A. 0.6 blocks per game, which is nearly on track with candidate C. Kind of dwarfed a little bit by candidate A and B. 45.7% from the field. So much worse shooter from the field. But again, I'm going to tell you right now, the other three guys are all near seven footers. This player is not a seven footer. This player is a guard. Shoots 35.3% from three, which is the second best on this list. A 48 and 30 team record, which is, uh, with my calculations, second best on this list. And a 40 and 21 record when he plays. So the team is eight and nine without him, uh, which you know puts a pretty good mark onto him being extremely valuable. You cannot tell me that candidate D does not belong on this list. Now, do I think that he's going to win? Do I think he's deserving of the MVP? No, but I, there's been some pushback here. Every time I mention Luka Doncic as an MVP candidate, why? His numbers are substantially right in line with Giannis, Embiid, Jokic, okay? And you cannot tell me that the Mavericks have another star player and that Luka is less valuable when literally every single offensive set they run requires Luka to do something with the basketball because they are very, there's a lot of players on the Mavericks who are incapable of doing anything. Dwight Powell cannot do anything without catching around the rim. Maxi Kleba has been shooting terribly this year. Dorian Finney-Smith, Reggie Bullock, those guys don't dribble the basketball. Jalen Brunson, a six foot one point guard is the second best player on Dallas, okay? That is the reality here of the situation. You can't tell me Luca doesn't belong in the conversation. Now, do I think he's going to win it? Do I think he should win it? No, but I am going to put it out here. Luca deserves to be an MVP candidate, and I think he should finish in the top four. Giannis, Embiid, Jokic, those are the top three guys. Embiid, I think, probably finishes third. And you get into the Jokic versus Giannis debate here. And it's very tough for me. I'm going with the better defensive player, Giannis Antetokounmpo. And now Nuggets fans, I know you're going to start typing and say, whoa, Jokic has all these great advanced analytics defensive. Watch the games. Okay. Giannis is a better defender. There is quite frankly, no question about it. Giannis has been really playing great at the end of games. And I think realistically, he plays harder than everyone else in the league. Uh, and if you want the player who should be an MVP, uh, and now this will be his third if he wins it this year, it's going to be a guy who plays hard on both ends of the floor every single night, gives your team a chance to win. Uh, and by the way, the Bucks are just phenomenal. Uh, and Giannis is mainly the big reason why. Middleton's not playing at the same level this year. Uh, Drew's been in and out of the lineup. Uh, they had no Brooke Lopez pretty much all year, so Giannis has been playing a ton of center, which I think he's one of the few players that could just all of a sudden pick up and play center in the NBA. Giannis deserves a ton of credit. The Bucks are reliant on him you know you can say the same is true with Jokic and the Nuggets yes but Giannis is a better defensive player nearly as good offensively and and maybe just as good offensively he scores the ball better uh and is a much better passer than he used to be Jokic obviously still the better passer but if you know realistically Luka's right there in the conversation with Jokic in terms of passing as well uh so for me Giannis I think again this is a very narrow race uh, and I think realistically, I don't have a prediction for this one. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked if Jokic wins it because of the advanced analytics. Uh, but I think eye test is more important than, you know, whatever some advanced numbers say, uh, because a lot of those do have certain biases towards certain players at certain moments. Again, thank you guys so much for watching. Hopefully you did enjoy. If you did like and also subscribe to the channel. Again, these are my own thoughts. So very possibly you guys defer an opinion. That's completely cool. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section. I'd love to hear them. And we'll catch you in the very next utility sports video.